Hello, Amlan. Thank you for joining Next Wave. Thank you. Thank you, Young. Happy to see you, even though it's remotely. But it's always a pleasure to see you. So Mobile Eye, which is one of the pioneers, company really drove the whole concept of a safer driving uh, and enable people to think possibility of autonomous driving. And I know you've been involved in this for a long time. I've been in your car already several, several years ago. And uh, I remember test driving and uh, what the possibility is. So maybe you can give a perspective of where it had been in terms of uh, a mobile eye journey and where we are today and where we are going. Well, first, I invite you again to come and drive our test cars. <laughs> it's now really, it's really magical uh, the way the, the, these cars uh, handle themselves. Now, I, I think one, one needs to take a step back and just understand what is the nature of this challenge. And, and if you look at products today, there are two types of products. One, one family of product is, very, very sophisticated from a technological point of view, but low accuracy. It means they can fail often and it's fine, like you know, a PC, like a smartphone. These are very, very sophisticated uh, engines and products, especially from a software, hardware embedded point of view, but they can fail and it's okay if they fail. The second family of products are not so much sophisticated, but very, very, very accurate. It means that they, they, they fail rarely and an aircraft, an airplane, is an example of such a of such a product. Now, the, the tolerance for failure is, is basically zero, and it's not that sophisticated. You know, the, the, the aerodynamics are things that are known from for more than a century. Uh, autonomous driving is both. You have to be very very sophisticated. We're talking about cutting edge silicon, cutting edge software, cutting edge data driven algorithms, cutting edge AI. So very very sophisticated, but on the other hand, very very accurate. The tolerance for failure. Is, is, is almost uh, zero. And, and this is where, where the, the conundrum, this is where the big challenge uh, is. So we, we are kind of building this in, in, in several layers. The first layer is defining what is the mean time between failure. You know, what makes sense in terms of uh, an MTBF of a perception system? What makes sense of an MTBF of a decision-making uh, process? You decided to change lane and you did it in a, um, in a uh, not uh, a safe uh, manner and there's an accident, what is the probability of something like this uh, happening? So we develop technologies around it. One of them is, is RSS, Responsibility Sensitive Safety, which uh, uh, attempts to standardize uh, the decision-making process of a robotic uh, engine and uh, reach consensus with regulatory bodies in terms of how do you define um, the border between recklessness and carefulness. And once a robotic engine knows what it means to be careful, it can then follow this uh, um, consistently. So this is this is one big uh, one big challenge. Another one is to define the mean time between failure and a perception system, and we do that through redundancy. So we build redundant uh, systems. So for example, at Mobilite, we have a a subsystem of only cameras, just cameras doing an end-to-end -end experience of autonomous driving, and then we have a separate system, just radars and ladders doing an end-to-end, -end, no cameras at all, doing an end-to-end, -end, and then find them in order to reach a, a very redundant and very, very low mean time between failure. Second challenge is scalability. Now, eventually, the holy grail of autonomous driving is consumer level, where you buy a car, pay an option uh, price of a few thousands of, uh, you know, of dollars, and then whenever you want, you sit in the back seat or you go to sleep. Uh, for this, you need scalability. You need to be able to drive everywhere. And one of the limiting factors in this is, is maps, high definition maps. So we have a technology, crowdsourced uh, uh, technology, in which many of our production vehicles from uh, many of our OEM uh, partners are sending data to the cloud and, and we build high definition maps. Just recently, we launched a test site in Munich where the entire, where with 5,000 kilometers of roads being mapped completely automatically just through crowdsourced uh, data. And uh, we have uh, um, uh, our uh, customers, like uh, car makers, uh, go and test this uh, car, and it's really magical. Third one is regulation. You know, accidents will happen. No matter what you do, accidents will, will, will happen. Um, and then the question is, is how, how is this going to be handled from a regulatory point of view? You know, there, there's criminal liability, there's financial li liability. Uh, one needs regulatory uh, certainty. 
in this area. And this is also an area that we're very active, working with regulatory bodies around the, around the globe in order to reach a consensus of a regulatory certainty in order to enable autonomous driving. This is, this is a major, major point. And the fourth and last challenge is how do you build a business, a viable business, when you're talking about a development that could take many, many, many years. And uh, uh, luckily for, for Mobileye, we have driving assist as a spectrum. So we are building the technology, combining both driving assist, which generates the money, and autonomous driving and technology which we develop for autonomous driving trickles down to driving assist. Uh, recently, we announced with the Geely in, in China, a system we call Supervision, which would be launched uh, next year, August, September next year in, in China, which with 11 cameras around the car, two IQ5s, which is basically productizing our camera subsystem of our AV, develop, of our AV uh, development. So this allows us also to generate a business by, uh, by influencing the evolution of driving assist to more and more advanced uh, driving assist while we're developing autonomous driving. It's great. I mean, it's the as an engineer, the, the car is really becoming a supercomputer with a sensor set up built in. In this case, it would be cameras, obviously, but also radars for the days where you cannot see things with the camera and augmenting each other and then being able to give you the range and the possibilities and being able to object detect uh, and what's out there. Let's talk about a little bit of the work. I believe you're working uh, in Israel and others. Uh, this whole concept of robot taxi. Uh, do you see robot taxi coming next few years or do you think this is a concept? So the first, uh, the place of robot taxi in, in kind of this uh, long vision, we see robot taxi as, as a step along the way for a consumer, uh, for a consumer uh, autonomous uh, car. It's a step because there, there, there are certain limitations that are very helpful. One is that the tolerance for cost is not that high. You can put a system that costs say ten, tens of thousands of dollars in a car and it's still viable from a business perspective if you are uh, shuttling people uh, like a ride hailing and, and, and ride uh, sharing. Second is the scalability. You don't need to, to drive everywhere. You can drive in geofenced areas, uh, you know, describe a polygon of say uh, 100 kilometers a square and you provide a robot taxi service only in that polygon. It still makes sense from a business perspective. And third, from a regulatory point of view, it's easier because you are, you are regulating a fleet and not a consumer. So regulating a fleet, there are all sorts of reporting responsibilities, back-end, teleoperations, all sorts of things that the regulator can put on a fleet. And it's very, very difficult to put on a, on a, on a, uh, on a consumer uh, product. So this is why Robotaxi seems like a very attractive step because it can build its own business, you know, ride hailing and ride sharing uh, by removing the driver and saving about 80, 85% of the operating costs of today's ride hailing and, and, and ride sharing, sharing. And it's a corridor to eventually reach a consumer level uh, product in which you and I can buy a car, a few thousands of dollars extra option, maybe if it's even $10,000, for a few thousands of, of dollars, buy a car and whatever you want, sit in the back seat. But we believe that to get to that point, Robotaxi is a very, very useful and, and advantageous uh, uh, step. So we are, we are uh, building that uh, capability. For that reason, we also purchased MoveIt uh, half a year ago. Uh, at the heart of the pandemic, we, we, we purchased MoveIt. And together with MoveIt, we're building this end-to-end, -end, Mobilize building the self-driving system, uh, self-driving vehicle, and then MoveIt is building all the remaining layers from the customer experience, uh, fleet optimization, mobility intelligence, in order to provide a service. And we're going to, uh, we have regulatory support in Israel. We're working on reg regulatory support also in other places. And we believe that 2022, we can start removing the drivers from a fleet of about 100 vehicles in Tel Aviv. Wow, so this is really a mobility as a service uh, in a way, because robot taxi is enabling, let's say, uh, enabling tour, but also you're adding the applications and management tours on the top of it so that you can be able to provide end-to-end -end experience as a way to uh, 
improve the capabilities and also testing the possibilities of removing the most expensive part of the uh, Uber economy, I guess. Now, are you thinking mobile eye as a technology enabler? Or are you thinking of actually going all the way to end-to-end -end service? No, we, we, we are building all the way end-to-end, -end, but, then, but then we'll make a decision uh, at the, the appropriate time, what to license, where to partner, what to do end-to-end -end all ourselves. But the technology will be built end-to-end, -end, including the customer experience. And then through uh, partnerships and, and licensing, uh, we can then uh, extend this from a business uh, perspective in a way that makes, uh, that, that makes sense, kind of reaching a right balance between capital and uh, uh, partnerships. Very interesting. I'm going to watch this one very carefully. Let's talk about another subject. I'd like to get your pers perspective about where it all came, where is it going? We founded the company back in 2010 with, with my partner, uh, Ziv, Ziv Aviram. Um, I think both Mobileye and Orca is looking at AI at the edge, right? So Mobileye, all the AI is being computed in real time in the car, not in the cloud. The same thing with, uh, with Orca. The vision is to build a wearable technology. That means AI on you, whether on your eyeglass or, or on, on your shirt. And this AI both sees and listens to whatever, whatever you see and all the acoustics uh, around you and tries to provide you value. So, so uh, the question is, what, what is this value? So we kind of decided to take society and peel it layer by layer. So we said, what would be the first layer of society that if you had a device that can see and interpret the visual world, it will provide you immense value, then it's blind, blind people and visually impaired, they don't see or they don't see well. And if you have a device that sees what you cannot see and then whispers in your ear what you are, what you are seeing there, it could be of great, uh, of great value. And this is what, where we started. Today, this device, you know, it clips onto eyeglasses and we also have a version which is handheld, uh, scans the visual world, understands everything, understands about objects, about faces, about uh, text. It knows how to lay out the text. If you're holding a newspaper, it knows where are the titles, how the articles are, are laid out and so forth. Of course, it can read to you. It will understand hand gestures in order to understand what, what you want from the scene. And it will also understand your voice. You can, you can ask it questions. For example, you can open a newspaper and uh, ask the device, read me the headlines. And within a fraction of a second, you'll start getting all the headlines. And then you can say, stop, uh, read me article number three. And then it will start reading article number three. If there is a person in front of you, it will tell you who, who that person uh, is. If it's a product, money note, it will tell you who it is. If uh, you ask what's in front of me, it will tell you every object that is in front of you. And then you can ask it, guide me to that object. It, it's really trying to take computer vision and natural language processing, put them together and provide an experience to someone who doesn't see that it will not regain his sight, but at least it will be able to, to cope with the, with, with the visual world. The next uh, thing that we have been doing, we are going to launch early January, a product that we, for, we unveiled last uh, CES. It, it's, it's really magical. The idea is to, uh, it's called the cocktail party problem, helping people that have hearing disabilities or even mild hearing disabilities. The idea is that if you have many, many people in front of you talking at the same time, like when you're in a restaurant uh, situation, lots of noise, lots of people uh, talking, what a device like this can do, where you have a camera and you have a microphone and you have a compute, it will lock on to the lip movement of the person in front of you and then filter, tune in only to the voice of that person and kind of remove everything else. You know, what, what, once you try, it's really magical. Sounds like James Bond experience. This is a very interesting technology. They can argument and supplement a lot of people as people are getting older their memory is getting impaired or going decreasing. And so it can it could be very interesting supplementary products that can help people's memory and being able to realize the uh, context. But at the same time, I would imagine people are worried about privacy of their data. So it's a question of privacy must be very interesting uh, issues that they have to manage in this particular category of products. Yeah, so, so uh, privacy was really a killer. So we, we did experiment with a technology 
uh, with technology, which is the purpose is not to help people with disabilities. It is to recognize faces, just recognize faces. And this is, I think, what Daniel had uh, showed you. We put it on, uh, on Kickstarter. We shipped 1,000 such devices to kind of test you know, how it is accepted by, uh, by the public. And the device really, from a technological point of view, works re really well. Um, it learns faces of people uh, that, that you see. Of course, those faces are stored in, in the cloud. But the privacy issue really killed it. People are not comfortable, are not comfortable with this kind of appears what, what, what appears like lack of, lack of uh, privacy. So this is why we didn't push this product into mass, uh, into mass volume. And instead we focused on, let's help people with hearing disabilities. Mm -hmm. Here there's no communication with the cloud. Everything is done on the device. Uh, there's no privacy, no privacy. Issue. An edge device that are helping people to live better, actually, and helping them to have a site they may not be able to have using cameras and being able to using mics. It's a very interesting innovation, and uh, I'd like to get a sample and try that out as just a way to learn more about it. But that was that is very impressive. Um, I have a question around the uh, changing subject to now a uh, big company. So clearly I used to work at Intel uh, as my first job actually after college. It's been a great experience and great company. But the, uh, the question for you is that you are very fast moving, hard charging startup entrepreneur that believe in revolution, but then you are in a big company, Intel, which used to be a revolutionary, but now it's becoming more like, you know, a big company, uh, much bigger bureaucracy and organizations you have to manage. So how do you thrive in a large company uh, with your startup mentality? It's a great question. I, I think the relationship we have with uh, Intel has been very, very uh, rewarding and I'll explain why in a moment, but let's take a step back. You know, when you are a subsidiary of a, of a large corporation, you have this kind of sense of security. But I, I, I quickly learned that this sense of security could be overrated. You really need to think as a startup. You need to, uh, you know, in order to, to do something meaningful in life, you have to be hungry. If you're not hungry, you cannot do meaningful uh, things. So you need to be very, very crisp on your uh, vision. Uh, you need to be uh, very efficient in the way you manage your uh, costs and you should always drive for profitability. These are kind of the, the tenets of, of a good, good uh, startup. So even if you are part of a big corporation, if you want to, uh, to survive for the long run, you need to continue thinking as a startup. And uh, at the time of the acquisition with, with Intel, Intel understood that in order for this you know, acquisition to succeed, they should keep it. Uh, mobilize as a subsidiary and not integrated into, into the big machine. And this has turned out to be very, very successful. So on one hand, we continued our startup uh, mentality. On the other hand, we, it was like going into a candy store where we looked at what Intel has that we can start, uh, uh, that we can start using. And we built a division we call IC, that this, this division is something that we could not have built as Mobileye alone. It is a division that is taking technologies from Intel, like silicon photonics, like uh, radar technology, and building the next generation leaders. These are frequency modulation, coherent wave. This, this is kind of the, the cutting edge. So th this, I think, is an acquisition that should be studied. This is an acquisition that really should be uh, in, the, in, in the mindset of the companies that go and acquire other, other companies. It's a very, very successful acquisition. That's really good to hear that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, where we are with uh, machine learning and AI. Clearly, a lot of AI machine learning has been very effective in solving particular domain, particular applications. And people start talking about this concept of general AI. And I like to, uh, because given your background as a professor and expert in AI at the Jerusalem University, I'd like to get your perspective around where is it going and where are we today and where are we going on this general AI perspective? Well, actually, <clears throat> we are in the midst of a revolution. Things are moving very, very fast. So um, the kinds of AI that we are used to is what, what you said before is narrow AI, solve particular problems, you know, play chess, play Go, 
um, you know, have a perception system for autonomous uh, driving, do decision making for autonomous uh, driving. These, these are all narrow, narrowly defined problems. The new frontier right now is language, natural language understanding. In the past uh, two years, uh, new networks have been defined. These are called transformer networks, you know, originally from, uh, from Google uh, researchers. Um, and these, um, this kind of technology is, is revolution from, from two perspectives. First perspective, uh, if you can conquer the language uh, frontier, that means you can have uh, a computer that understands language and can write language, then you are getting closer to broad AI. I'll not call this general AI, but much broader AI than the kind of AI that, that we are today. But more importantly, the techniques of these uh, networks are based on a new way of handling data. It's called uh, self-supervision. Mm -hmm. The classical way of training networks is you take data and you label that data. For example, if I want to recognize cars in an image, I take lots and lots of images, and then I have someone that will put a bounding box around every, every vehicle, and I'll use that as input for a tra to train a system that will try to recognize a, a cars. And, and, and this, this is a very limiting factor because then you cannot treat unlimited amount of data because every data you need to go and, and label it. The way you train these language models is completely self-supervised. Uh, self it means that you can build now monster networks that are trained on unlimited amount of uh, data. It's just have enough uh, compute and you can build something monster in terms of its, in terms of its size. And this self-supervision idea is now transcending back to pattern recognition, back to computer vision. There is now a, a wave of uh, academic uh, papers and also industries is heavily looking into it, how to uh, be able to train perception systems, systems that want to do pattern recognition without labeling the data. So this opens up now a new, a new frontier in which you can build a monster network. Take, for example, GPT-3 from OpenAI, 174 billion uh, parameters. This is really a monster network. And, and what we have seen, what, what the community has seen is that these monster networks is kind of a brute force way of doing problem solving. It's not elegant. You know, a, a scientist of 10 years ago would kind of cringe in thinking that, you know, the way to solve a problem is simply build a monster network. But these networks are surprisingly effective. What GPT-3 has, has been showing is, is, is really remarkable. Um, so I believe that, and by the way, I, I, I co-founded a company, AI21 Labs, that is really building these kinds of uh, uh, systems for language understanding. And we recently launched, three weeks ago, uh, a writing tool called the Wordtune that is really doing magical things with, uh, with language. I'm personally very, very interested in this field, both in terms of language and what those networks, what those technologies can do outside of, of, of language. And I believe that if we simply continue this path within this decade, we will have broad AI. That is really an interesting subject that we're going to, we're going to be watching and observing, but uh, you're very optimistic about where the next step would be. And you think we're in an inflection point, which is very important. Can I just have you have one last question that is really given your background as a professor, entrepreneur, and, and really running actually very important business at Intel as well. What advice do you give to entrepreneurs? Uh, yeah. Normally, academia and business do not mix. Now, I'm, I have been you know, fortunate to be able to hold both ends of the stick in a, in a firm manner, to continue being an active and productive scientist, at the same time build a, a meaningful a businesses, but they don't have a prescription for it. You know, regardless, my advice to uh, entrepreneurs is you need to think long. You need to think not two, three years away. You need to think 10 years away, 15 years away, and you need to be patient. You need to build a, a meaningful business is something that takes many, many years uh, to build. There are no shortcuts, there are, there, are no free, uh, there are no free lunches. And find, once you, have, once you crystallize your, your vision, make sure that you find good people that will help you to execute because execution is, is, is really the bottleneck. You know, people, many people have good ideas. Uh, they fail in execution. So find, find
find very, very good people that will help you to, uh, to execute and then work on your decision-making skills. You know, leaders make decisions every day, many, many decisions. Uh, you know, a, a good leader, the number of decisions that a leader would make in a week is comparable to the amount of decisions that a normal person would make through its lifetime. If those pillars are set, then I think the chances of success are much, much higher. Great. Well, you really have shown that you're a very long-term patient person and built a really great team from, uh, I mean, from 1990s, looking at the vision as a uh, tool and then building a business that, that now you pioneered around this whole idea of the autonomous as well as the uh, then moving into helping people to live better by using the products like Orchem that are coming out. So very broad, but clearly you've been looking at the same fundamentally what you can do with that technology into impacting society. And that's a long-term journey, wasn't it? Yeah, long-term is the key. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And hopefully we can meet in person, but at least we have a chance to, to talk through Zoom. Very good. Looking forward for your visit, Yang. Okay, great. Thank you.